Hi, welcome to Aim at One Mint. I'm Adrian, and it's my great pleasure to speak to you today about what is somewhat flippantly but very conveniently called ghost busting. I was mentored in this by the late Wendy Wright, who was a very well known clairvoyant medium in Southern Africa who developed her abilities from a really early age, from the age of three, in fact. We learned how to ascertain the energy in a place. We ascertain the energy affecting people, how people are affected, and we cleared that. We had no teachings from anybody about this. We didn't read any books. We didn't consult with other people. We, I won't say we made it up as we go along because we certainly had guidance. It helped a lot that Wendy could very clearly see spirit. She could see dead people, if you like. So we all chucked up our jobs and did this full time for five to six years and we had miraculous miraculous for us especially we were amazed at the results we were humbled by the fact that God deemed it fit for us to be the instruments of his power to clear places and to clear people and we often went home exhilarated by what had just transpired and by that I mean the difference between when we arrived somewhere and by the time we left. It was amazing to us. I think often more amazing than for the people we performed the service for. And we guaranteed what we did. We guaranteed that a place that we cleared would stay cleared. If people met our conditions, and in the case of going to places, everybody had to be there, everybody had to be part of it, so we cleared earthbound spirits, we cleared witchcraft, and we performed exorcisms. Now here, there were no guarantees. Unfortunately, you cannot guarantee that someone who's been possessed through their own free will does not again become possessed. Many people think that what I'm talking about is in the mind, and I have to say that's not the case. I've had that in chunks. I've had people close to me poo-poo, what I do or what I believe or what we've come across. If that were the case, we wouldn't have been so busy and so successful. And we wouldn't have seen the results, the change in people, the change in places. The work was absolutely exhilarating, never a drain. People, unfortunately, became a real drain, having really skewed expectations beyond what we were doing for them. They wanted us to, in some cases, wipe their bums for the rest of their lives, it seems. I'll give you an example of a woman phoning Wendy to thank her for having got rid of what was holding her son down at night. Now asking Wendy to do something about his exam results, the exams he'd already written. And that's not a one-off kind of thing. We also got called to places where people had nothing wrong with the house. People were casting about for a reason as to why their life isn't working out. Or there's people wanted their houses blessed, and which is not something we do. That's other people's domain. When I talk about ghost busting, what am I talking about? Let's go into it a bit more. In the main, there are three things that affect people. The one is earthbound spirits. What people call ghosts. Earthbound spirits is more correct. They are bound to this plane generally by lack of understanding of a life beyond this plane. And the problem is that they don't, aren't necessarily malicious or bad. However, it's an incorrect situation. There's somewhere else for them to go. There's somewhere else they're supposed to be. They're not supposed to stick around here. With a few exceptions. There have been times where we have come across earthbound spirits who are here to make sure something gets finished. They sometimes get stuck afterwards, but sometimes 
there have been a few occasions where us being called to a house has been to actually advise the people of what that earthbound spirit is trying to communicate to them. And straight away, the earthbound spirit is gone. It's not here to linger. It's not here knowing that or thinking that this is where it's, it lives. And that's where the problem comes in. Where an earthbound spirit thinks this is where it lives. And they're in a limbo. They can't communicate. They can't be heard. They can't. They don't have a voice, if you like. And so they're attracted to people. And this is the thing. They're not generally attracted to insensitive stupid people they're normally attracted to people who are sensitive why because it's like those people are like a light in the dark to them why would they go to a stupid person who has no idea they're there they want some recognition that person's not going to know or not recognize them so they're often attracted to people who are sensitive they're often attracted to churches and places of worship because that is like a light in the dark to them and they're often attracted to children who are in many ways closer to God, more sensitive. Animals know that they're around. One of the guys, I remember him saying, if only people could see like cats. So cats and dogs and I'm sure other animals can see spirit. They don't always react because they don't know that we can't see spirit. I haven't actually discussed this with my pets or anybody else's, but... They think, well, if you think it's cool, you know, we live here with you. However, animals may behave strangely, like a cat going down a passageway and leaping at a certain point. Animals are very aware. Having an earthbound spirit in a, in a home or in a, in, a, in a place is, as I said, an incorrect situation. And what happens in an incorrect situation is it builds up the wrong kind of energy. And that negative energy, because it's not the correct energy, can get really bad. And likewise, the earthbound spirit can get really bad, really frustrated. And that's one of the ways people become possessed. When an earthbound spirit who has been here for who knows how long, because they were in limbo, and remember, they don't really have time. They've got all the time, if you like, in the world. So... They want recognition and they want more control. They've got no control. So they'll move stuff about perhaps, but a body will do really nicely. And that's where possession starts. It's not only earthbound spirits that possess people. They are much nastier non-corporeal entities. And I came across a research paper, which I, I put in a link below in the description box. It's called more Things in Heaven and Earth, Spirit Possession, Mental Disorder, and Intentionality. And to speak about how someone gets possessed is difficult to do because there is no one-size-fits-all. And anything I say is to some extent a generalization, but I'm going to say it anyway because there is a, there are, there's a ballpark, if you like. Often... People who become possessed are people who have a diminished sense of self. And having an, something possess them gives them something. I won't say it gives them something good, but often it gives them a sense of power. And if we've seen how much power they wield within, their, within the household, within the immediate sphere. Sure, their lives are diminished yet further. They become completely removed, if you like, from normal life. But they do gain a sense of power. Conversely, however, often powerful people get possessed because that's a very attractive host. So as I said, there's no one size fits all. And whatever you might think about such people, I want to caution you. Do not judge. Just know one thing. They are going through stuff that you didn't want to know. They are learning some seriously difficult lessons. Maybe you, you could say some don't learn their lesson. Or how do they get there? It doesn't matter. The end result matters. Everybody's on their own path to God. 
we don't we don't perform exorcisms on people who don't ask themselves who don't want to change their situation we have been asked many times to perform exorcisms on people who are not interested it is all about free will you know that's one of the th gifts from spirit is free will and it's ours and it makes us makes us more of who we are the more we exercise it but if we give it away well it's up to us to get it back no one else can do it for you i keep talking about we talking about teamwork and ghostbusting i need to read from matthew 18 in the bible where it states verily i say unto you whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven again i say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask it shall be done for them of my father which is in heaven for where two or three are gathered together in my name there am i in the midst of them i have on many occasions had to perform ghost busting on my own I was, I've been a travel writer for over a decade and I've gone to many haunted places. I want the place cleared because it feels horrible. And, well, I don't have an option. The place has to get cleared. An incorrect situation has to be rectified. I didn't tell anybody I was doing this for a long time until I, I realized that I should tell them whether they thought I was nuts or not. Because there I am, a travel journalist. Here I come with something completely left field. But I knew the place would feel better. I knew they'd probably feel better in the place. And they would probably attract more clientele. And I should have asked for commission. One such place is the most haunted place I've yet been. Where it was like a railway station for earthbound spirits. And worse. Very complex situation. And a highly skeptical owner. but And a charming man. I just couldn't even sit through his introductory welcome. I was beset with this bombardment of negativity. And I had to tell him what I was doing. And he was scratched his head, but he felt a lot better. And so did the place feel better. He's writing about it in, in his memoirs. I'll be very interested to read it one day because I don't recall what I tell people half the time. It comes to me, it comes through me. I it goes out people have often asked if i can recommend ghost other ghostbusters maybe there is some sort of international ghost busting network i still probably wouldn't comfortably refer people because my brother who i work with interestingly enough He's not just my blood brother, he's part of the same group soul, which is unusual. And I will talk about group souls and things like that in other posts. So we've done ghostbusting together for, for many, many years. And you really want to know that the person next to you is working exactly the same way. And he's helped other groups to perform exorcisms. And from what he's told me, I'm not comfortable with uh, their modus operandi. So I wouldn't recommend anybody else. I'm sure there are people that do a brilliant job. That's just, I don't mean to sound closed-minded, but it's there's a lot of teamwork involved. When you're working with somebody, you've got to be on the same page and there's a lot of focus. The job for me, most importantly, is what is going on here. Not who it is. What's happened. What the result is sort it out i guess i'm kind of a dragon <laughs> in chinese horoscope i'm born in the year of the dragon on the day of the dragon so i'm going in there really really focused on the job at hand and people may be disappointed that i don't tell them those things i'm not there to commune with dead spirits i'm there to remove them to send them to where they should be so what are the symptoms how do you know if there's something in your house, if there's something bothering you? There are many symptoms. The, the main one is headaches. And it's a specific type of headache. It's like a band around the temples and the head. 
a pressure headache. Uh, the other symptoms are lethargy. People, no matter how long they sleep in a house like that, waking up tired. And often as they're dropping off, they're being strange, often metallic, mechanical noises, like a tapping on the roof as well, or a knocking in the cupboard. The cold patches of air. People sometimes see, see something in their peripheral vision, like dark tumbleweed almost. Often, actually. It gets worse than that. We've come across several women who had had laparoscopies, I think they're called, a lap scope, for a very specific pulling pain in the lower abdomen. Ghost pregnancies too, excuse the pun. Lots of ailments that they feel that aren't diagnosed. And that's something that happened to me. I wouldn't be speaking to you if somebody had not, and not for the first time, set out to destroy me using witchcraft. A number of years ago, I fell really ill. The doctor was at a loss. She was about to admit me to hospital. Tests revealed nothing. This went on for months. And I was sent to a medium where I happily spoke to a guide, a guide I know well, who told me it was witchcraft. And it was quite explicit about where it came from, how it was done. It wasn't willy-nilly. It was premeditated to destroy me. And I quote, he said, think of yourself as a voodoo doll being poked. I know what it feels like to be held down at night. I know what that is, to be pinned down, immobilized, unable to shout out, get help. It's terrifying. That's how I got started. And something similar happened to Wendy to get her started. The, the only thing I know of that does help is prayer at that time. As difficult as it may be, and it often is, in a place that's affected by negativity. It affects prayer. It affects relationships. People feel better when they're out of the house. They get on better when they're not at home. The other thing is, Relationships, not just between them, but between, between them and other people are affected because they are being affected by the negativity in their home. It's like a rain shower. It doesn't matter how it started or who caused it. Everybody gets wet. And so other people are often put off them. So opportunities get blocked. People call it being blocked. And things become more difficult than they should be. One step forward, three steps back. And, and people's thinking becomes clouded. And they can't see further than they know sometimes. Studying is a problem. Just as prayer is a problem, studying is a problem. So lots of things like that. Aches and ailments, absolutely. Now, when there's an earthbound spirit in a house, it tends to affect the entire household. When witchcraft has been performed on somebody... The effect is not the same. There is still negative energy in the house. It's just not the same. It's generally targeting one individual. Similarly, with possession. With possession, the entire household may not be affected. The person is affected, wherever they go. And I, nobody wants to be around a possessed person. They are really put off. I talked about people who've got an earthbound spirit in the house having problems with relationships. It's on a very much, it's, a, it's on a much higher scale with a possessed person. No one really wants to be around them. How do we clear people? Well, how do we go about it? If we're visiting a house, we ask people just to sit while we walk through the entire place to check out what's what. Not what's visually what what necessarily, but what's going on in the place. Then we explain how they're affected, what's affecting them, and we clear each person. And sometimes we have to clear some people more than once. Depends what's going on. And that way we used to guarantee that 
people and places stayed cleared. Could never, as I said, guarantee that a possessed person stays cleared. That is ultimately up to them. How do we clear? Whether we're doing it remotely or not, we ask a person to sit in an upright chair, feet flat on the floor, legs uncrossed, eyes closed and relax. Not everybody's relaxed, people get nervous. But relax and we put our hands near their head, remotely obviously not, but we do the visualization. And they feel the power that flows through our hands from God to clear them. We get information, our hands get really hot. People feel the warmth around their head. They often feel other things as well. They might get a flood free chest. It varies, depends how a person's affected. Sometimes we have to top somebody up, we call it a top up. If they're really badly affected, say for instance, someone's being held down, we'll have to see them again. And there's some symptoms I left out now that I think about it. Being people might feel a weight on the bed, they might feel a foot being tugged and they may get pinned down and there may be sexual activity. Imagined or, or not. And the thing about being held down, I'm not talking about sleep apnea. And it's not in the mind. I'm not a weak-minded person. I can't even be hypnotized. I volunteered. I helped out a hypnotherapist once and I asked for some help to hypnotherapy. It wasn't happening. And for some of the things I've witnessed or been party to, to be hypnosis, mass hypnosis of some special thing, well, it would be pretty grand. And some of those things are pretty dramatic. Possessions can be pretty dramatic. And that's why I've said we have to have the person's buy-in. They have to be willing to change. They have to believe that God can help them. Who's God, what God, doesn't matter. Suffice to say, we've met Muslims more Christian than Christians would like to believe they are, charming Hindus, people from all walks of life. It doesn't matter. But the belief that God can help is absolutely pertinent. So if we perform an exorcism, we work with great care, but with real firmness and with the person's permission beforehand, because it may involve physical restraint. We used to have a strong metal folding chair, which we had additional loops welded to so that we could pass Velcro th through. It could be like out of the movies, and I'll give you an example. It actually happened in, in our healing rooms one night where we had two people in the same room being cleared of possession. One was a petite young woman with three strong men. I'm, I'm a hundred kilo guy and two other people of a similar size, pretty much holding the chair in place with this deep voice booming out saying, you won't find me. Well, we had, and that wasn't the only thing that had possessed it. That was the last thing. Hatched and dispatched happily with her working, with her working to change her life. And that's the most important thing. If a possessed person is, sits there and expects it all to happen for them, well, we walk away. We don't do that. That's not good enough. They have to want to change. And the changes have been amazing. I remember not recognizing a woman on whom we'd performed an exorcism the week before because she was absolutely transformed. I didn't recognize her. A light had been turned on the dark marks on her face and the dark rings, blotches around her eyes were gone from her now twinkling eyes, which were previously red and bloodshot. And she radiated a different, lovely body language. Talking about that woman who I didn't recognize who had been exorcised the week before, it always puts me in mind of the saying, no man can take away the victory that another man has over it himself. I need to read something to you because I can't remember it. <laughs> and it's something we used to give to people when we went to their houses and leave with them. And it's entitled Be Positive. All religions agree on one thing for the very first time on earth. 
that we live in the worst time the earth has ever known. Yet, what do we do about it? We are all sometimes surrounded by bad people and evil forces. We all have to work to counteract this. Buddha said, do not think lightly of good or evil. Drop by drop, your bucket is filled. Life is a series of choices. You choose whether your bucket is filled with good or bad. If misfortune befalls you, it does not mean your bucket is suddenly filled with evil. Work to be strong. You can. The easy way is often the evil way. Each good or bad thought you have makes you into the person you are today. With all things in life, what you put in has everything to do with what you get out. So apart from carefully choosing, what goes into the attitude or approach is terribly important. We're not here on earth by chance. We have to learn through good or bad or even terrible hardships and pain and suffering. We are only here to grow and become better for God. We see so many people who do everything carefully and correctly, yet are not positive in their approach. Very often they are pious people, praying and regularly attending religious services. Very often they are learned and sophisticated. However, their lives do not seem to work out. God does not work properly in their efforts because, although they believe in God, he does not have the correct place in their lives, in their hearts, and therefore does not work through them so that they are enriched. Being holy is not always being spiritual. We ask everything of God, yet He asks nothing of us except that we realize Him more in our lives, in all things, and get closer to Him. That is for us to do. God is always with us. We have but to recognize that. God is not merely a distant external force, but is within us. Yet many, when they pray, are asking God to do everything for them, as if God is somebody you can employ, as if God or the world owes them good fortune. Look back in your life. What did you learn from the most? The answer will be, the time in your life when you endured suffering well, and this made you strong. We always have a choice to act positively in a bad situation or to become bitter, blaming God or anyone else. The mind is the most powerful and precious thing in the universe. When you feel down, go to somebody you know who will cheer you up. Don't hide and wallow in your depression. Be strong. Learn to have good thoughts and then follow up on them. Be responsible to God, then yourself then others. Everyone knows that what you do in your life comes back to you. When you act or speak, ask yourself, would I be doing this if God was in the room? Well, He is. I'll be very interested to read your comments. And if you want to get in touch with me regarding mental healing and clearing of negativity, my email is in the description box below. If you find value in what I'm sharing, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell too, so you don't miss any of my posts. And please remember that you are a sliver of divinity and keep your sliver shining, reflecting back to God, and let no one dull that shine.